Hi, this is David Orlovsky, and welcome to the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. And whether you're listening with our friends over at Torah Anytime, whoever you watch or listen to your podcast, it's certainly nice to have you along for the experience. Um, if you uh, if you haven't been following, and what's one of the great things about a podcast is that you can always go back and listen to the previous ones. We are in the middle of doing a series on um, marriage, dating, marriage, uh, all the steps that go into it. Yeah, and um, as I mentioned, there's not many people giving hadracha in how to get married. Once you're married, lots of people tell you. Uh, how things are a mess, but, you know, okay, so let's get into it, and uh, we've dealt now with, we're only talking about relationships where we're talking about getting married, we're not talking about boy-girl relationships where you're just friends, we're not talking about uh, anything like that, we're talking only about person wants to get married, and this is a very important point, a very important point that not everybody appreciates. When we're starting the process, we're saying, I want to get married. Sometimes people aren't ready to get married. They got to be honest. Yeah. There was a young lady I know who started dating when she was 19. And when she turned 38, she said, I think I'm finally ready to settle down. And she got married a few months later. Um, you you got to know for real. If I'm if I'm really ready to get married or not, right? So I started telling you a story about these guys who were learning in the mirror, who asked me to give them a vod on dating. So they came in, and I said, first, there's no no recording devices, because sometimes when you record things, people get a little self conscious. People recognize their voice when the recording makes the rounds, and uh, you know. I said, there's no recording. Uh, you can take notes if you want. And everyone had their notebooks and they all had, they were ready to take notes. And I started them off with a trick question, which I do often. I, I, I have trick questions. Um, we have more or less established already that I'm the little boy who notices that the emperor has no clothes. And so I'm the one who asked the question that maybe not everybody else will focus on. I remember once I was doing a Seder and people came in with lots of notes. And I started with a trick question. I said, why do we have a Pesach Seder? You know, not one person could give me a coherent answer. I got answers, but none of them were coherent. <laughs> so, uh, so I started off with a trick question. Why should you get married? Now, before we go, because uh, I do try to speak uh, as clearly as I can to enunciate, to make sure that everybody can follow. In fact, I remember there are certain people who are from the hearing impaired community who follow this and they do the um, captions and uh, and they say, you know, usually it's pretty easy with you because you, you know, you speak, uh, speak pretty clearly. So I try, which is why I want to go to this week's uh, sponsor, Naftali Pfeiffer. I listen to most podcasts and shiurim at double speed. The theme song sounds like not much in wisdom instead of knowledge and wisdom. <laughs> Played on double speed. I figured you would enjoy that nugget. Sponsored in honor of my wife who makes me slow down my podcast speed. So uh, thank you very much, Naftali, for this sponsorship. Anyway, which is pretty amazing because uh, the problem that has plagued me for most of my life is that I speak very quickly. People uh, often complain that I speak a little too fast. In fact, I give a number of Masils Sharm Shiorim online, and 
one of them I gave, and I really just ran through a lot of material very quickly because it wasn't really the main focus. I just wanted to get through the example he was bringing. And uh, it's now taken me two weeks to fill in uh, all the material that I said. People were like, I, I, you, you just threw out so much information. What did you mean? So I had to, I had to now go back and fill it in. <laughs> At double speed, it's almost amazing to think what I must sound like. But anyway, so I have these uh, young men together in a room. And I start them over the trick question. Why should you get married? So the first guy, without even hesitating, he says, to give. And all the guys look at him, Shh, yeah. Yeah. to give. Must have gone over very well on a date. Yeah. Girl would say, why do you want to get married? To give. To give. And uh, he was very proud of himself. He must have read a book or something. I don't know. Yeah. I said, you have to get married to give? can't give to anybody in the mirror, can't learn with a younger bacher, you can't clean up your apartment for the other roommates, you have to get married to, to give. He was very disappointed. He really liked that, uh, that idea, and it was, uh, <laughs> it got over really well. So another guy says, well, you know, to have children. I said, okay, so you're not looking so much for a girl as much as for good breeding stock. Now, you don't really want to see a resume. You want to see a DNA strip, you know. You want to find a strong peasant girl, very many strong children. <laughs> so another guy says, well, there's too much in life for one person. I said, well, hire a personal assistant and pay him by the hour. It's definitely going to work out cheaper. Who's that? Uh, somebody else said, it's a mitzvah. And I said, great. Great. You'll have the easiest time. First girl you go out with, and then you move give her the ring, go back to the base measure. You know what <laughs> You're just a, it's a, it's a, it's a chalois of a mitzvah, you know, that tfisa, you know, so she's a, she's a, you know, a shtick mitzvah. <laughs> anyway, there were more answers. They, were, they weren't as good as these. These were the best answers. And finally, someone said the real answer. My mother's making me. And I appreciated that. Right? So finally, a guy said, okay, what's the answer? I said, I'll tell you. But I want you first to reflect on the fact that um, all of you are in Shidduchim already. Yeah. The fact that you haven't found somebody that uh, interested you was just luck. And that one of you can tell me why you should get married. And I said, don't feel bad. Most married people can't answer that question either. <laughs> because everybody gets married because everybody gets married. That's why you get married. Because that's what you're supposed to do. You get married. Why do you get married? What's the underlying purpose? So, Saif Ma'asev Machshav Tchila. Before you can set out to do anything, you have to first know what it is you're trying to accomplish. I was at a Shabbaton once. I, I'm sure I must have told this story before. And the fellow comes over to me at Shalashudis and he says, This is a very successful Shabbaton. And I said, Really? Why? He says, Well, we have a lot of students and they're all having a great time. So I said, well, is the purpose of the Shabbaton to get a lot of students to make sure they all have a great time? And he said, well, what's supposed to be the purpose of a Shabbaton? And I said, Shal is at the wrong time to ask that question. When you first set out to, uh, to, make, your, um, uh, to make your Shabbaton, that's when you have to ask yourself what will define whether or not this is a successful Shabbaton. Because sometimes you could have things that people mark as success. I'll give you an example. When I used to run NCSY, I used to have two types of Shabbaton. I had the regional Shabbaton where we get hundreds of kids. So everybody could see it's a really important uh, 
organization, there's a lot happening, it's very exciting. But that's not where the real work took place. The real took, work took place at the smaller Shabbatonim that we would have throughout the year, where there were less kids, and we were able to really deal with issues and concentrate on different things. And that's where a lot of personal growth actually took place. But, but I knew what the purpose of each Shabbaton was. I didn't have any other expectations. But you have to know what it is that you're setting out trying to do. Yeah? The Masil Susharm says, the way that you make decisions is first you need definitions. First you have to define what's good and what's bad. And then you can decide whether or not this fits into my definitions. But if I don't have definitions, so everybody wants to have a good marriage. But what does that mean? Uh, I used to write a column uh, on Chinuch in the Hamudia. And after a number of years, they wanted to take all my articles and put it together as a book. And I said, that's not a book. I know people do it, and I'm not here to judge. Yeah. Uh, but to me, that's not a book. It's a collection of articles. Find somebody who has an old collection of Hamudia and read my articles. Yeah. But, but uh, 30 articles does not a book make. A book is safer, is, uh, is sipur, saf, is an edge, is a border. It has to tell a story. It has to have parameters. It has to go from a beginning, middle, and an end. So I sat down to rewrite uh, the things that I had written in the form of a book on Chinuch. I've been working on this for many years. Because as I started working on it, I realized that there's no way to talk about chinuch without talking about marriage. Because that's such an important part of what goes in when we are mechanech, our children. And then I realized there's no way to talk about marriage without talking about life. So that became the working title, Life for User's Guide. And I keep uh, rewriting it. My first book wrote itself. I never published it but it wrote itself, it wrote very quickly. It's an introduction to Judaism for people who don't want to read a book on Judaism. It's called The Last Book You Read Before You Assimilate. And uh, I never published it because uh, I, I, I have a very particular vision of how I want to see this book and it never happened. So I still have it. It's great every now and then I, I, I read through it and laugh. <laughs> it's a great book. But anyway, but it literally wrote itself. And this one I keep rewriting it. But the, the last beginning I was working on is I said, okay, let's talk about marriage. And I asked this question, why do you get married? What's your goal in a marriage? So like I said, everybody wants a successful marriage. You just have to define that for me. What is a successful marriage? What would you consider to be a successful marriage? And people usually define it in the negative. Well, I know what a not successful marriage is. <laughs> My father, Oliver Shulman, got married 1949 to my mother. Whatever his other considerations were, he, his, his goal was very clear. He wanted to marry a Jewish girl and he wanted to bring up a Jewish family. That was a priority. Now, a lot of people will tell you, I got married because I was in love. I remember I, I used to do this once, uh, particular audience. I'd say, how many people here plan to get married? Almost every hand went up. I said, how many of you plan to get divorced? No hands went up. I said, listen, approximately two out of three marriages end in divorce. So I should have seen two thirds of the hands go up. Somebody here is not being realistic. <laughs> Why do you think you won't get divorced? And they say, because I'm in love. 
I'll be in love. I said, everyone who gets married is in love. You don't spend that much money on one night unless you think you're in love. And they believe they're in love. And in the secular world, they may have been living together for years. And yet it ends in divorce. So obviously saying I'm in love with the person is not enough. If I don't have a definition, how do I know if it was a successful Shabbaton? I don't know why I made the Shabbaton. How do I know if it's a successful marriage if I didn't define beforehand what a marriage is? And I'm prepared to say it might be different things to different people. I'm okay with that. But do you know beforehand what you want? And so uh, very often two people meet. Some enchanted evening. You will see a stranger. You will see them calling across a crowded room. Yeah. You see somebody. And it's, uh, you just find this person fascinating. Right? I don't know what you can see that makes a person fascinating. More likely, it's just attraction. Yeah. And you start dating this person. If there's just attraction, then it's, it's unlikely to continue. I was uh, I was teaching in Urs and the guy comes back and goes, I went out with a girl. She is the biggest ditz I ever met. I mean, she is just an airhead. She is the dumbest girl. I said, why'd you go out with her? Goes, She's beautiful. I said, so you're going to break it off? He goes, not right away. <laughs> I mean, eventually, because that's just not enough. <laughs> but you see somebody, well, well, what, what, what's, obviously there is that they're attractive. Now you sit down and you have a conversation, and it turns out that not only is the person attractive, but they're personable and they're easy to talk to, and whatever, whatever. And now you find yourself in a relationship. Every now and then I've been called in to, uh, to deal with, uh, you know, a, um, uh, people who are going to get intermarried. I had a I had a mother call me up and said, listen, I have a daughter and, um, you know, she's, she's going to get intermarried. Can you do anything? I said, when's, I mean, is there, when's the wedding? It says Sunday. I said, what do you want me to do? Get on a horse and you know, pull her up from the altar and ride off with her into the sun. <laughs> what do you think? I said, where were you when she was in high school? I could have brought her in then. See, it's why I could have worked with her. We could have done something with her. Now she's, she's you know, a few days away from the altar and you want me to, to, to do something? You know, I'm good, but I'm just not that good. You know <laughs> but sometimes I have a little more lead time, you know. And uh, and most of the time, the person says to me, look, I wasn't planning to get into marriage. I wasn't planning to. Uh, it happened. I met somebody. I fell in love. And, you know, que sera, sera. Now, if you knew beforehand that you didn't want to get into marriage, why would you date non-Jewish people? I used to give a class in intermarriage when I used to teach in Discovery. And I'd be halfway through the class and I said, how many people now would get intermarried? None of the hands came up. And then I said, how many of you will interdate? And all the hands went up. I said, could you explain that one to me? They said, it's just a date. I said, do you know anyone who got married without dating? Did any of your parents get married without dating? All the years I'm doing this, one time a hand goes up. I said, your parents got married without dating? 
says, yeah, they're Hasidish. I said, what are you doing in an intermarriage class? <laughs> Do you five-ish, bane-ish, think Mary O'Reilly? <laughs> like, what are you doing here? You know? I said, uh, for, for the rest of you. <laughs> yeah, nobody, nobody, uh, uh, although not every date ends in a marriage, every marriage starts in a date. And when you go out, you might find yourself falling in love. Nobody plans to fall in love. Nobody jots down 315 fall in love. What do you do if you fall in love? Now you're stuck. Here you're telling me I don't want to intermarry, and now I fell in love with someone who's not of my faith. So what am I supposed to do now? One of the guys in the room, because guys are you know, a little more emotional, said, if I find myself starting to fall in love, I'll break it off. I said, that sounds great. I want to I wanna watch this. Mary Christina, yeah. Um, I could never see you again. Uh, why? I'm starting to love you. <laughs> well, this was just a fling, and you were some chicks that I was going out with. That's fine. But I'm starting to develop some actual emotion here, so bye. <laughs> I said, I don't think even you're that shallow. His friend says, you don't know him like I do. <laughs> But that's what people would tell me. I wasn't planning on falling in love. But why are you getting involved in a relationship? Nobody knows when they're going to fall in love. Any two people can fall in love. Don't believe it when people say you can't fall in love. Any two people can fall in love. So, so you're dating this person. Do you really think you're going to find someone intelligent and attractive, date them for a year, and then grow to despise them? You have to at least recognize the possibility. So if you're going to date non-Jewish people, then you can't be surprised when, you know, you suddenly end up with a, with, with a situation like that. Okay, that's dramatic. I've met at least three families where one spouse is Shomer Shabbos and one is not. What happened? And they went to college, going to the Hillel, whatever it was. They started dating someone they weren't from. But they weren't planning on getting married to them. And then they fell in love. And they said, we'll work it out. I get involved usually because of the kids, because the kids are totally messed up. Dad comes home from shul and says, does anybody want to eat Shabbos lunch with me? And mom is jingling the car keys. We're going to the mall. I'll put your face on a mug. Dad, is it okay if we go? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I'll, I'll sit here by myself. Yom me My two little challah rolls. My little glass of grape juice, some cold cuts. <laughs> what are you going to do? We get divorced over this? Get divorced? But why'd you get married? I wasn't planning on falling in love. Then why'd you date someone who doesn't have the same values as you? Okay, they were environmentalists. They really care about the environment. Very important to them. They meet somebody, and uh, they fall in love. And strange thing that it never came up, my environmentalism. And it turns out that uh, this fellow likes to pollute, likes to dump uh, uh, barrels of toxic waste into our natural waterways. So what do I do now? I break up over the environment? Okay, so I go downstream and I clean it up. <laughs> How'd you end up in this situation? You should have been dating people from the Sierra Club. I mean, like, if, if this was important to you, but you don't realize what's important to you, you divorce the relationship from the goal of what I want in a marriage. And part of that is because people haven't really thought about what they want from a marriage. 
I got a number of letters after our last podcast uh, discussing um, uh, you know this came out just at the right time I was involved I met this boy we were we developing relationship and they you know I, because of that I broke it off you know? and it's very hard of course it's very hard you're forming an emotional bond with somebody I it might not be the person that I should marry but I can fall in love we'll fall in love with anybody it happens we've seen it yeah I mean sometimes there are indications you know when Charles and Diana announced their engagement and someone said you look like you're very much in love and Diana said yes and Charles says, well, what's love? <laughs> uh, that was a little hint. <laughs> oh, a hint of what was to come. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you got you, you, you to gotta decide beforehand, who am I going to allow myself to fall in love with? Because I can fall in love with anybody. And you're, and you're foolish if you think not foolish so i have to sit down first and say what is it that i want and that is the hard part the hard part is but sitting down right now and say what kind of a home do i want sometimes you have one spouse that wants an open home with a lot of and the other one guards their privacy and doesn't like people around. Sometimes you have people who um it's him. They're happy. They're happy with a little bit. And other people are, are grossly materialistic. And they have to be honest about that. It's okay. Embrace it. Look for a rich guy who will keep you into the style of which you become accustomed. But don't pretend that that I'm I'm ready to live a life of uh, sacrifice if you're not. So I had a girl who uh, goes to seminary and she comes back, and she knows that she's supposed to marry a colo boy because that is what a seminary education is designed to do to teach you that you have to marry a uh, color boy and if you don't then you're basically a failure um not just as a, as a jew but as a human being i mean basically there's no reason for you in this world you know you want to work working boy working boy why don't you marry a horse marry a horse i heard one father say marry a horse already yeah you're gonna marry a working boy so she really wanted to marry a, a learning boy. And she had the most important qualifications. Uh, her family was rich and was willing to support. So there was this boy who was a real serious learner. And uh, he went out with this girl. And she did not fit the bill. But the parents were so nervous about having to support him. So they pushed him into this marriage. And they got married. And he learned for a year. And then she realized this isn't what she wants. And she drove him crazy until he dropped out of yeshiva and got a job. Because she thought that's what she wanted. She really did. She thought she wanted to marry a boy in learning. But she didn't. That's not what she really wanted. You've got to be honest with yourself. Don't marry the boy that you're supposed to, that you think you should marry. Marry the person you want to marry. When I first moved to Eretz I remember there was something I was doing. I don't remember what it was. Uh, somebody wanted me to do something, you know. And they said, don't you want your daughters to marry the best boy in the yeshiva? And I said, no, I want my daughters to marry the boy who's going to be the best husband and father. That's my goal. So what am I, Rosh Hashiva? I, I, I have a moisid to turn over to my son-in-law. I'm looking for a son-in-law. 
if he knows how to tell funny stories, I'll get him a few gigs. You understand? But uh, you know, uh, I'm looking. I'm looking for a son-in-law that I can say, oh, turning over my voice. <laughs> uh, you got to be real. So, so what is your expectation in marriage? What do you want from a home? And most people never think about this. I don't think about what i want so we have we're very good at externalities uh, i had a girl uh, one of my first years when i was teaching in seminary and uh she took my masil sasham class and after the first semester she met with me and she said when i came here i had my whole life planned out I knew where I was going to live, what kind of boy I was going to marry. I knew what kind of shaito I was going to buy. I had my whole life all worked out. And now I'm disgusted by the person I almost became. And then she said, and the odds are I'll probably do it anyway. Because if we're not clear what we want, so he seems like a nice boy. She seems like a nice girl. Uh, pretty easy, pretty simple. But what do you want from your home? Now, I'm going to give you aspirations. And you don't have to follow these aspirations. I'm just giving you aspirations. Because I'm an aspirational sort of a person. Yeah? I'm inspiring and aspirational. Sometimes I listen to myself and even I am moved. That's how, that's how, effective, <laughs> how effective I am. Yeah. Why does a person get married? That was the question I asked these young men. And I said, we all know this one. Ish has a yud and Isha has a hey. Together they spell Hashem's name. Okay. Why does the Yish have the Yud? The woman the Yish have the Hey. Because Yud represents Shemayim and Hey represents Aretz. And it's a joining together of Shemayim and Aretz. Because there are two stories. One is Hashem separates the Shemayim and Aretz. And the other one is He creates a human being, male and female. And then He separates them. Why? So they should join back together. And where do Shemayim Va'aretz join back together? Yaakov Avinu goes to sleep on the Harbayis and he sees a ladder going up to Shemayim. And he says, this is the Shara Shemayim. Says the Balturim. He says, Manoira Hamakam Hazah. How awe-inspiring. And he says the word Naira spelled backwards is Aron. Where the Aron goes, that's where the awe goes. It's awe inspiring. The base of Mikdash is the, the connection between Shema and Ba'aretz. Yud K in Gematria it equals 15. 15 steps going up to the base to the base of Mikdash, going up to the Azor. Coincidence? I think not. Because this Ish and Isha is what's so essential. We're building a bias. And that's why when uh, when Shlomo Melech built the base of Mikdash, he decorated it with drawings of men and women embracing, says the Gemara Yuma. Don't try this in your shul, even if it's very liberal. It doesn't go over the same way today. Why? Because Shlomo Melech was trying to explain that the essence of the Beis HaMikdash is to be able to bring together us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like a husband and a wife. There are a lot of ways of relating to Gadish Baruch Hu. Avinu Malkeinu, he's our king. 
There's a sense of awe. Yeah. Years ago, decades ago, I used to uh, would go to England. I don't know if they still have these kind of shawls there, but I have one of these shawls, somewhat cavernous. Everybody wore top hats. Yeah. And every now and then someone would get up and say, you're in a house of the Lord, 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 Lord. Please maintain the decorum, quorum, quorum, quorum. And there's a sense of like, awe-inspiring. Then, yeah, there's Avinu, Tati. We're a child relating to our father. And that's good. But it's not the ultimate. The ultimate is Shir Hashirim. Us, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu as two lovers. It's too graphic. Frankly. <laughs> Shir Hashem is just too graphic. I was uh, 15, 16 years old. I was an FBT. Most people are familiar with the term BT, Balchuba. I was an FBT. Flaming Balchuva. Anyway, so I remember Shabbos Cholom Oi Pesach, the Elaine Shir Hashirim. And we had the uh, Sancido translation. And uh, this uh, 30, 40 something Balabos sitting next to me gives me a little nudge. And he says, Hey, here's a great line. I bet a girl would like this. I said, sir, we are in synagogue. This is scripture. <laughs> we show a little respect. <laughs> and he says, well, I can't believe they allow this in the shul. And he was right. The Chazal tell us that they wanted to hide away Shir Hashirim. Because it was just too much. And Rabbi Akiva says, if all of the Sifri Nach our Kadosh, this is the Kadosh HaKadoshim. The Kadosh, the Holy of Holies. You know what the Kadosh HaKadoshim was? That's where, yeah, we would come together with a Kadosh Baruch Hu Ke'ish Ve'isha. Yomim, it says that they hid Yoshiyahu in the uh, base, uh, in the Cheda Mitas. In the in the bedroom, it says Rashi, that was the Kodesh Hakodesh. That was the bedroom, that the place where us and Kaisa and the Kodesh Baruch Hu are most intimate. In the intimate moment, you read Shir Hashem. So Baruch Hashem Art School translates it homiletically. They have made Shir Hashem uh, safe once again to uh, to read because you have no idea what it means. You know. You don't want people reading psukim like, I grow drunk on your kisses. You understand nothing good is going to come from this. You understand? But it's so graphic because that's the passion we're supposed to have for Kaddish Baruch Hu. And the only way you can learn that passion is through marriage. And that's why Eliezer comes back and says, oh, do I have a shidduch for you? She's beautiful. She's got great midos. She's smart. You know, and the Malach killed your father-in-law, so you don't have to worry about him. <laughs> and great. What a shidduch. And Nisim, I had Kvitsa Derech, the water came up to greet her, you know. And Yitzchak says, very nice. Tell her to go into my mother's tent and see if there are the Nisim of the Beis HaMikdash. The cloud over the, over the tent. The, the bread stays warm from from Shabbos to Shabbos, the candles stay burnt, stay lit. Sorry, that's a great word. Candles stay lit. Yeah. I, I'm looking for a girl who I'm going to build a Mishkan with. Bilam wanted to curse us out of existence. And he looks at our tents and he says, Matovu Olech Yaakov, Mishkan Asecha Yisrael. Every Jewish home is a Mishkan. If, the, if it's just a base of Mikdash, I can destroy the base of Mikdash, but every home is a Mishkan. 
And that's why when people get married, that's rebuilding the base of Mikdash. That's the bias nem on the Yisrael that they always talk about. Oh, Yishama, Biyare, Yehuda, Hovechot, Zaz Yerushalayim. Once again, will be heard in the streets of Jerusalem when the Geula comes, the redemption. Kol Sasan, Vekol Simcha, Kol Chasan, Vekol Kala. Because when a Chasan and Kala come together and build a new home, that's a Mishkan. And so you have to ask yourself, what am I getting married for? I need somebody who's going to take care of me, cook and clean and, you know, and take care of my things. A Filipino, as one Israeli woman put it to me. <laughs> or am I looking for someone who's going to be the Kohen Gadol in my base of Mikdash that I'm going to build? Now, what does that mean, Poyal? What does that mean to build a home that's a Mishkan? We're going to have to talk about that. But be honest with yourself. Am I just looking for someone who I can have a good time with? I'm not looking to build anything. As this one guy in yeshiva said to the mashkiach, I don't know what you guys want from me. I just want to marry a beautiful girl, go into my father's business, make a lot of money, go on trips, buy her jewelry, drink the finest wine, drink the finest scotch. You know, and I'll dive and I'll learn, but you know, but what am I looking for in a marriage? It's what I'm looking for in a marriage. Okay. I used to tell this story over, and girls used to say, Do, do, do you still have his number? <laughs> I could uh, I, I could see that. <laughs> and that's okay. You know, I've heard people wax poetic about about uh, you know uh, you know a new couch that they bought or how they fixed up their house or you know or whatever it is. Okay, so be honest. Look for that. I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, where there's going to be money. We're going to live comfortably. Some people want to live a life of chesed. Some people are Kirov monsters. You've got to be careful if you marry a Kirov monster. They want to have people over all the time and be mashpia. It's my friend, Rabbi Rudman, who just made a chasana. He used to say, he says, people want to be mashpia, big gobs of hashboya, hashboya on you and hashboya on you. Uh, okay, I hear that. But don't just meet somebody and say, oh, this looks good. And that's why you ask people, why'd you get married? I don't know. Why'd you get married to this person? On those rare occasions when I have to do marriage counseling and I have no idea what I'm doing, I have no degree, no, uh, but sometimes people say to me, listen, we've been to three therapists, two rabbis, a Kabbalist. We're on our way to Basin to write the get. So you can't really mess it up, you know. So, okay. But there was one time I sat down with a couple. And I said, I can save a marriage, but there's no marriage here. You guys don't like each other. You have absolutely nothing in common. I said to him, what do you, what's good about your wife? There was this long, long pause. I said, she's pretty. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Another very, very long pause. She's a good cook. Okay. I said to her, I didn't have much more to add. <laughs> I said, you people have nothing in common. <laughs> what do you do? So we watch movies. I said, okay, so if you're Siskel and Ebert, you can build a relationship on that, but that's not a marriage. We can't just do movie reviews. <laughs> There's nothing there. But they didn't know where they were getting married in the first place. 
So first you have to do the hard work and decide, what do I want out of a marriage? What are my expectations? Where do I see myself in 50 years? Mitch Hedberg, the comedian, he says, uh, he went in for a job interview. Woman said, where do you see yourself in five years? He says, uh, celebrating the five year anniversary of you asking me that question. <laughs> okay, all right, that's an approach. But what, what would you consider a successful marriage when you turn around 25 years, 50 years from now? What do you want them to say? Had a couple ones to say that. They worked well together. They didn't need anybody to solve their problems. You know, they, they worked things out among themselves. They, you know, they, they, they were efficient, you know. I said, that's not a marriage. That's a business partnership. Yeah. Maxie and Sammy, they always worked together. Maxie did the buying. Sammy did the selling. You know, Maxie took off the last two weeks in July. Sammy took off the first two weeks in August. You know. When they bought the building, they didn't even need a lawyer. They did it among themselves. They were able to work everything out. I said, that, is that some, that's a marriage? So we're going to talk more. But first, you have to sit down and do the really hard work and say, what would I consider a successful marriage? If I turn around and I say, okay, okay, I want to get married, what would I consider a successful marriage? What do I want? What are my dreams and my aspirations? Not just I found a nice boy and he's so cute and... Uh, and uh, he davens nicely, and they tell me that he learns well. And I found a nice girl, which is very gashik. She knows how to cook, and you know, and she's pretty. And uh, you know, and uh, she went to the right seminaries, you know, and her family's willing to support me. <laughs> well, we're done. <laughs> now maybe that's good. I don't want to say no, but. You got to do the hard work first. Saif ma'asev ma'asev That's it for this week. If you want to find out more about the podcast, you can go to rabbialowski.com. You can leave a comment. You can send an email. You can sponsor an episode. And uh, you can uh, download the, uh, the theme song. And uh, you can... Um, Join one of my online shiurim, Dafyomi, Masil Susharim. And that's it for this week. I'm David Orlovsky, and this is the Reverend Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Torah and Simcha, ready to go. The Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Knowledge and wisdom will help you grow. Lots of fun in every episode. And we don't have to rhyme, no, we don't. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show on RabbiOrlovsky.com. Torah, anytime, YouTube, and more. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Torah and Simba, ready to go. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. Till next time, till we meet again. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show. It's the Rabbi Orlovsky Show.